Um, I'm going to be talking about the legacy of the First World War, and in particular the League of Nations, but what it means, or not the League of Nations, the Peace Treaty of Versailles, uh, and what that means for us today. Um, and I think I need to make just a couple of comments uh, to put things in perspective. I was giving a talk the other day on women in Africa during World War I, and it struck me after 18 years of research in this topic that we needed a bit of clarification. Why do women not actually feature in any of the historical documents? And quite simply, it was a white man's war. And I have got no issues with it being a white man's war. Um, it provides a bit of a challenge for us, no doubt. Uh, but that explains that the documents in the National Archives, Imperial War Museum, National Army Museum and other collections are predominantly to do with white men. Uh, but we do find quite rich documents, as Dan and Martin were explaining, and John has made good use of, and I have um, made phenomenally good use of, uh, African, whether they're black, white, Indian, uh, coloured, etc., um, narratives, stories in the National Archives and these documents as well, because, emphasis, it was a man's war. Um, and the important thing about that, and I'm not going to be talking any more about women, that's for another context, uh, and I'm not a woman or feminist historian, I'm a political historian. Um, the important thing about that is that it tells us we need to look elsewhere for information about aspects of the war. And when it comes to Africa, that is such an opening and a liberating experience that we are not constrained by the narrative that seems to dominate the Western Front and other theatres of war. So it's a real privilege to be able to work on this theatre um, and to, to deal with what was traditionally regarded as a white man's war and to break those myths down and bring out the unknown stories. <coughs> and I should also mention, uh, linking into commemoration, uh, we had the first shots were fired uh, in West Africa, followed the second day in East Africa. The last uh, battle was fought in Africa on the 13th of November 1918 and the surrender on the 25th of November 1918. But the minutes, two minute silence we have on the 11th of November every year originated in Africa too. Uh, a politician by the name of Percy Fitzpatrick came up with the idea he'd lost a son on the Western Front New important people like Lord Milner and Lord Curzon, who had the king's ear, sent a message across, and by the time he landed in America on the 11th of November, the minute silence was in place. So Africa has a lot to contribute uh, in terms of the First World War. So I looked at this first, well, presented a paper on the end of the First World War for the first time in 2009 and looking back to see what I had presented, I was quite intrigued to read the following. The years 1914 to 18 are best remembered for the horrors of war, yet the same years were significant in shaping the world we live in today. World War II merely developed on what had gone before. As much as the war in Africa had been ignored in the recollections of 1914 to 18, so the, so the discussions prior to and at Versailles concerning Africa have been ignored. And as far as I know, I'm the only one to have really researched the peace treaty of Versailles in terms of Africa, uh, which is in, was part of my thesis done way back in 2004. And this is the second time in all those years um, that I'm actually talking about the peace treaty of Versailles and Africa. It says a lot. So I think a study of those discussions, and particularly those concerning East Africa, sorry, Christine, I'm back to East Africa. <laughs> it's been my specialism. Um, but I think in this case, it is a very important one. The discussions concerning East Africa, which was the dominant territory uh, that the Allies were fighting over at the peace talks as well, um, sum up what everybody in Europe was actually fighting for. In Europe, there were five of the 16 countries had claims to um, what they wanted in, for their countries in Europe. But when it came to Africa, 
they had to consolidate around one country and why they wanted this territory. And so the East Africa discussions or the colonial discussions in Africa forced the European countries to actually admit what they're fighting this war for, which I think is crucial and very, very important. And I think it's a, um, an aspect that European historians have missed out on uh, in terms of looking at the, the wider issues. So why, to understand what came out at Versailles, why did Africa go to war? Well, technically, they went to war because the European powers went to war. They had no choice. However, locally and individually, there were more specific reasons. So for Britain, as we heard earlier, it was about radio stations. They needed control of the seas in order to protect shipping and to stop Germany from um, getting, stopping Britain getting supplies across to, to Europe. So we've got the Nauen radio station, which is the one up in um, Togo. And we also had Southwest Africa and Dar es Salaam were the big ones that were attacked. For France, it was literally defending the motherland. The Germans had invaded France, they needed to protect their motherland. And so with the only European power, Belgium's a couple, not many, um, which sent troops from Africa to fight in Europe, and black troops in particular, to defend the motherland. And that was predominantly due to the French uh, colonial policy, which was integration, as opposed to the British policy, which was to continue using local uh, structures um, and support people that way. So the colonial systems were very, very different, and the German system was quite different as well. And we tend to forget that when we look at the reasons why countries uh, were involved and how they were involved in, in the war. <coughs> Belgium wanted to have territory to negotiate with at the peace table. Uh, Germany had invaded neutral Belgium, and Belgium was quite certain early on that they needed something to be able to bargain with in order to reinstate Belgium as a state back in Europe at the end of the war. And they realized if they could get African territory away from Germany, they would be able to use that. So Belgium, despite being neutral, went on to what we called a defensive offensive, uh, which is quite an interesting concept. <laughs> Portugal eventually got involved in the war in 1916, March 1916, and that seemed to be predominantly for issues of status and um, obligation. It was Brit Britain's oldest ally, going back to 1368 or something. Uh, Britain and Germany had asked Bel uh, Portugal to stay out of the war because it didn't suit either of them to have Portugal come in at that time. And then in 1916, when Germany was sending one ship too many and Britain wanted those ships, they asked Portugal to go into the war so that they could get the German ships. So people entered the war for different reasons. Locally, countries entered as well for different reasons. And we see that in the way the different African countries get involved. West Africa, Togoland, as you can see, collapses on the, four, on the 26th of August 1914 because they just don't want to get too involved in this campaign. There's a lot more at stake for them than staying the course. Cameroons, there's a bit more um, fight between the, the officers uh, or the government, the governor and the military. Things go on a bit longer. Southwest Africa, a really interesting one, where Dan mentioned there was a rebellion in South Africa. The Germans didn't invade while the South Africans were sorting out their rebellion. And I haven't figured that one out yet. It's on my cards one day. And German East Africa, eventually they end up falling into war in a way, whilst local retributions, uh, retaliations, revenge <laughs> campaigns um, or es escapades all take place across the border without the governor knowing. And by the time requests go in for neutrality, uh, it's too late. So people go into war for very different reasons. The impact of this war, and we'll come back to Versailles in a little while, but the impact is quite phenomenal, and I think we still suffer from it quite a lot today. The environmental impact, uh, as you can see, that's the riverbed for the Lake Tanganyika expedition. They had 200 rivers to cross, dry riverbeds. The only way to get across taking 40-ton trucks with boats on uh, was to fill the riverbed, and they did that by cutting down trees. <laughs> 
500 laborers were recruited locally to do that. Can you imagine the number of trees that went down? That's just one. The devastation, the forests of Africa, no longer. Um, and I'm quite amazed when I hear people tell me that areas of Kenya, which were hugely forested, are now just dry desert areas, uh, and the dust storms are phenomenal. And I imagine West Africa has a similar sort of thing. Disability, people, you know, um, we heard about malaria, dysentery, etc. People suffered quite phenomenally. Trench, trench foot in Europe, nothing, I think, compared to what the men had to deal with in, in the African campaigns where we have jigger fleas, having to cross crocodile-infested waters, etc. Um, and the long-term impact of that, I don't think, has actually been taken into account in, in the history stories. The end of the war, how did people get home? We know that the, the European soldiers, the South African white soldiers who were there, were shipped home. But there's very few, if any, accounts of how the black Ascari soldiers, King's African Rifles, <coughs> were taken home. Some suggestions are there that they were left to their own devices to get home, make their own way home, because they knew the territory. Um, but we still need a lot to do a lot more work on, on that front. And you can just see some of the different terrains that the men had to, to cross. I'm talking about men. Women were there as camp followers and others uh, who were left to their own devices as well. We have another complication at the end of this war in the sense that German or black African troops fought for both sides during the war. So we have in East Africa um, the King's African Rifles, British soldiers, British trained men um, were laid off in 1911. And so to get work, they joined the German military because they knew about being soldiers. They joined the German military. During the war, as the British were, or the Brit Allied forces were becoming stronger and they were captured, they decided, volunteered, to fight for the British again rather than become porters or carriers. A status of being a soldier, better pay, etc. How do you deal with that um, in terms of managing or remembering people transferring sides. If people were found to attack the, the, the village that they had come from, being on the other side and they were captured, the stories are quite gruesome of the retribution that these individuals uh, received. The ideas of traitor and collaborator or um, supporter are very different in the African context to what they are in the European context. And we still have to deal with those complexities today. We can't take what we know about Europe and apply it to Africa. So that's the local situation. Internationally, the first talks or the first discussions when everybody gets together in Versailles are around the colonial or the, the old colonies, the old German colonies. What do we do with them? And they dominate the early periods of the European discussions over the peace treaty. It takes them from 1919 to 1923 to make a decision. There's a tacit agreement between Britain and France that France will get West Africa and Britain will keep to East Africa. The complexity is added, though, when America enters the war in 1917, because America <coughs> doesn't have a colonial policy, doesn't want anybody to have colonies. So what we have here is an official record of what's happening in the Versailles talks with the Big Ten and the Big Five, but behind the scenes is a whole nother layer of discussions going on. Britain and France come to an agreement um, and they announce it in the press. Belgium gets to hear about it and the ambassador throws his toys out the cot quite rightly, kicks up a fuss, says they've not been included and Lord Milner is pulled out from Britain to come and sort things out. Milner doesn't want to get America involved because that's going to be the end of colonies completely. And so an agreement is made with Belgium that, and that's that big circle there, um, Belgium will get the west coast of Africa providing um, Portugal gives up the northern part of Mozambique, uh, or the, sorry, the southern part of Mozambique to South Africa, gets part of German East Africa um, in, re in repayment, and Britain gets the whole of Tanzania. That's the idea. This all gets agreed, Portugal gets to hear about it, and they've got to make up, make the final decision because they own the piece of land 
Belgium has been promised on the west coast of Africa. Portugal says, no way, we can't give up any land, um, despite us being, you know, having no money, etc. We can't do that. Uh, we're not doing it. And we end up, as part of this agreement, with the map of Africa as we know it today. Belgium had, as part of the official discussions, got Rwanda and Burundi. Um, against their will, they had too many commitments in Europe that they needed to deal with, couldn't invest in Africa to the extent that was required. Britain couldn't get the land from them because the other agreements hadn't fallen into place. And so we end up with the nightmare of Africa um, as it plays out in later years with um, the genocide and the other issues where we have leaders in countries removed from power because of the fight between the two white armies, uh, removing the traditional chiefs, there's a vacuum there that can't be filled and we're still trying to fill some of those, I think in Congo particularly. Uh, and we have a similar case in southern Angola where the Germans invaded, instead of invading South Africa, they invaded Angola during the First World War um, to take this piece of land. South Africa ended up fighting for that in the Angolan South West Africa campaign. So a lot of this is, can be traced, a lot of the issues today can be traced back. 1923, they finally agreed on the divide um, with those big changes, as I've mentioned. And Togo, Cameroon uh, were combined and split with people being pulled in different directions. You don't have to worry about reading all of this. But I think this is some of the legacy that we do have, the negative legacy that we have of World War I in Africa. I've already touched on um, this, uh, Cong Congo and Rwanda. We had the Biafran War, um, which I, some people can argue that it, the links to the First World War are tangential. Uh, it needs a lot more study. But I think there are the links that can be made because people, peoples were brought together for administrative purposes to make admin's life easier without actually thinking about the local consequences. And we have fights such as in Biafra, such as in Rwanda. Um, currently even, you know, we've got elections coming up in Kenya. Uh, nationalist divides are coming through again. How much of those can be traced back to the First World War confirming of those boundaries for the best intentions for some, but not fully looking at the, the bigger picture or the long-term picture. Something to think about. Was quite intrigued to see Pan-Africanism um, sort of, it had been around from before 1920, but 1920, it seems to get a new oomph, uh, breath of fresh air, and they design their flag, which has filtered on through the ages and obviously impacted on the various wars that have taken place. Now, that list of names, they're on um, the Great War Africa website. This was following a discussion Christine and I had had um, in terms of legacy and a bit side picked up about East Africa. I was quite intrigued to see how many of the leaders at independence of African countries had been alive or around during the First World War. And that is them quite a lot. And I've taken it to people who were born up until nine, including <coughs> 1924, which gives us about a five year span of you know, those early formative years. Uh, and I think you can trace those leaders' policies in their home countries and how they, what they fought for in terms of independence back to experiences their countries had in the post-war years. Um, Kenyatta, for example, in Kenya, was very big on organization. And that was one of the things he had learned during the First World War. He had been an administrator in the, uh, for the British government, working on maps. And he had learned that in order to get people doing things, um, if you had them organized and working towards a common goal, you would achieve more than just everybody keeping to their own tribal groupings, etc. Tanzania, I was having a discussion with one of the previous high commissioners about um, remembrance of the war in Tanzania and he said to me we don't really remember that because it was a colonial imperial war um, but the big issue at the end of the war was land who cared about the fighting we had no land and the land that we had was devastated by drought and famine so the big issues were were around getting the farming going and getting people surviving again and if you look at Nyerere's policies that as he moved on 
that whole social enterprise of people working together, um, getting people out onto the land, even the education system, all gears towards that. I'm speaking very generally, but that's how it looks, taking a, a, a broad view. So I think there's a lot of work that can be done on different countries' um, approaches to independence in the 50s and 60s, going back to what the leaders were experiencing during the First World War. Nelson Mandela was born in 1918, 26th of July. Uh, you know, so again, he was part of that, the returning uh, Labour Corps coming back, the Carrier Corps, um, and the divides in South Africa that were taking place at that time. The other part of this moving on is we're really stuck with documents. Um, in terms of, we've got the documents here in Britain, but we don't have access all the time to the documents back home, as I call it, uh, in our home countries, necessarily. Partly because they've been destroyed by local fires, as in Kenya, there was a fire in 1925 that destroyed a lot of the archives. Civil wars have meant that archives have gone missing. I'm trying to source documents in Sierra Leone at the moment about lo men who were locally recruited. Uh, South Africa as well. You know, and these countries don't necessarily have the finance to be able to invest in archives. If you've got the choice between building a million homes, a hospital, uh, or putting money into preserving a, a dusty old document, which one are you going to go for? I know where my money's going to go. <laughs> I know where my money would like to go, but it's not where it would go. But, but I think that is part of the legacy of just life in general post-World War I that we have to deal with. And trying to put the stories together is rather a challenge. And I'm going to very quickly, because I hate being negative, and if we stopped on that previous slide, we would have a very negative view of the legacy of World War I. I'm, not, I'm an optimist, I like to think so. And I think that having, or going back to my comment at the beginning about this being a neglected area of research, we have a wonderful opportunity to actually create our own legacy of World War I. And for me, what keeps me going, and one of the children at one of the local schools asked this the other day, why do you study this? Why do you do it? Well, it is because every time I open a document, I find more about the humanity of man and woman and children um, in this campaign. The stories of people working together, irrespective of race, creed, color, gender, every single divide you can think of is put aside when you look at the First World War in Africa. There was no victor. The Germans surrendered on the 25th of November because of what had happened in Europe. The only victor in Africa was nature. And for me as a historian, that means we can discuss whatever happened in Africa as equals and genuine equals without any of the hiccups and the baggage that we have to deal with when looking at Europe. So it's, it's moving forward. And I do ask the questions there. Who's, who are we, when we talk about Africa, the memorials? John, we have those wonderful memorials you were showing about you know, East Africa. They were designed by white men. It's a step in the right direction to be inclusive but they're still designed by white men. What would a genuine African memorial look like? We have an oral tradition, generally speaking. So what would we design today, moving forward in remembering Africa? And I was quite intrigued. There's, if you can see the United We Stand image, I've put a label on it, United We Stand. I've seen this image for years and years and years, and I've not actually understood where it came from. I discovered this week in putting the slides together that it's from an African artist in East Africa. And I thought, that explains it all. And just look, you probably can't see too closely, but just look at how inclusive it is. Black, white, animals, vehicles, different types of trees, terrains, you name it, they're all there. And I think that, for me, is going to become an image of World War I in Africa and moving forward. Um, and I can go on and on and on uh, and deal with you know, the questions that John raised about the Mendy and so many other things. You can see I was scribbling notes all the way through while people were talking, but I'm not going to go through them. But I think there's one final bit before I just talk about our next steps. Namibia, which was Southwest Africa, 
became independent from South Africa in 1989. Uh, they were asked, uh, has anybody visited Namibia? Namibia? No. Oh, Dan, yeah. Yeah, a couple. A couple. One of the striking things about visiting Namibia is it became a South African territory uh, and then it got its independence, is that there are German memorials with swastikas on in Namibia. And you think this is just so incongruous given the history of the country. Anyway, they asked the, one of the current um, leaders of Namibia about this and were they going to remove them and he said, no. Memorials are like a, po like a photo album. They tell you how you got to where you are today and we will not remove them because they are part of our history. And I thought, what a wise man that is. So I'm not proposing that we remove all those memorials, um, but I am suggesting that we look at how we move forward and design our own legacy for the next 100, 200, 300 years and how it can be inclusive, having learned from what our elders didn't do for the best of reasons 100 years ago. So thank you very much for that. <laughs>